Welcome. Today we're going to look at one of those questions that um, will um, come crashing in on the life of every person if they live long enough, um, whether you're a believer or not. It's called the problem of evil. We're going to need the Lord's help, so let's be sure that we go before him right now. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and our hearts to you, the Almighty God, the one who uh, alone has all the answers. God, like, uh, like we recognize from the book of Job, that um, we all have many, many questions. And in love, God, you will provide for us the answers that you intend for us to have. But what happened with Job will happen with us. And we recognize, God, as we seek answers, we eventually will discover that it's not so much the answer that we need, but the answer-er. And indeed, you present yourself to us as the God who knows all and who has a purpose in all that takes place. We ask you, Father, to help us to humbly accept you and to recognize, God, that you will provide for us all the knowledge we're going to need. In fact, you have done this um, in your word and will continue to do so, that we might live godly lives in this present evil generation. But God, there are so many people we encounter that do not know this. They have not yet discovered who you are. They blocked you, Father. You're going to send us to them. You're going to help us to find that little crack, that little crevice that we might use to enter into their lives and begin to speak truth in love to them. I pray you'd prepare us, God, in our own hearts. Help us, Father, to have that compassion and love of truth that your son had. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Let's go. Problem of evil. Well, it is a problem. And it sometimes is, boils down into this heartfelt question. Why do bad things happen to good people? We're going to see that um, the fact that bad things happen to good people is not deniable. It does happen. Well, here in the Chicago area, a few a decade or so ago, a family uh, ran over a piece of metal. It was dropped off of a truck driven by a guy who bought his license illegally. And the back of the van uh, broke into flames and uh, the driver's children all perished. Awful tragedy. Terrible. It should never have happened. Why do these things happen? Pastor Willis and his wife remained and they discovered how... Um, your love, the God's love can be experienced in the midst of this terrible tragedy. They continue to serve as a testimony of their trust and, and, and love of God that he cared for them and cared for those children as well. Yet, it happened. So the problem of evil isn't just that bad things happen, but the problem of evil is that people try to keep believing that there's a good, loving God, powerful God, in spite of the bad things. Basically, uh, to put it succinctly, it's, it's how can all these three statements be true? God is all good, God is all powerful, and evil exists. Now the question becomes, why does evil exist? Either God isn't all good, the problem tempts us to believe, or maybe God isn't all powerful. Why should I believe in a being who either isn't strong enough or good enough to put an end to evil. And every human being will face, if they live long enough, a point in time in which that tension between their belief in God and their awareness of evil and the pain of the evil uh, is uh, dealt with. Well, there are different ways people have tried to tackle this problem of evil. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's not something that you can leave unaddressed. You, you seem to be compelled to find some resolution. One of the ways of attacking the problem is the, is the way that the atheist attacks the problem, and that is simply to say that there is no God. Or an agnostic, ah, if there is a God, he doesn't really, it's not significant, he can't really be known. That's what agnosticism means, you, you can't know God. And so it doesn't really matter. Sure, evil undeniably exists, and you know what? Humans are going to have to find answers to the effects of bad moral choices. Obviously, the atheist sees that sometimes choices are made that are, they have negative consequences. But their point is to say, quit blaming the devil and uh, quit waiting for help from a non-existent or nonchalant God. 
Well, some humans have tackled the problem of evil by questioning whether or not God is all good. And Manichaeanism, the belief system that uh, held Augustine in captivity for a while, also the ancient religion called Zoroastrianism, Greek paganism, Eastern paganism, they conclude that deity isn't all good. They're evil gods. They're kind of like bad superpowers. And there's a multiplicity of natures of, of gods. Or maybe there's more than one nature in the one God. And so there's this constant struggle going on between good and evil. Um, and so we recognize, I, I did my thesis, my master's thesis on a, on a, a, a philosopher named Edgar Sheffield Brightman. And he believed that along with God, there was something called the given and the given was this sort of black amorphic, amorphic force that competed with God. And God and humans competed against it. And process theology is another approach that people have towards this problem of evil. And, and here is where they end up saying that, that God isn't all powerful. He is all good, but he isn't all powerful. And so God's in the process of becoming just like we are. We're growing. We're, our power is being enhanced. So God's the same way. Otherwise, how can you relate to God as a person? The process theologians say. That's a bad use of philosophy, but you can understand how they're using it. So what happens is that believers pool their moral resources uh, together with God's uh, infinite goodness and his finite power. And together, evil eventually will be defeated. But now, evil will happen. Another way of looking at this is to deny the existence of evil. Oddly enough, the Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and the New Age religions many times kind of uh, brush off events as neither evil or good. Evil doesn't exist. In truth, the idea of there being a good and a bad and a, a right and a wrong is an illusion because they believe that there's only just the one. There's only one category, only one thing in it. That's monism. Sometimes it's expressed in the statement that God is all and all is God, which is, sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? But it's actually uh, empties out of meaning any possible spirituality of the name God because there's nothing that isn't God. Well, that's one way to make sure that you don't have to make any judgments about right or wrong. And um, moral dualism, the idea of the two right, right and a wrong, is, is an illusion to them. What you have to do is merge with the one or awake in nirvana or find peace in the constant flux of uh, events represented by the yin and yang symbol. And all will be well when you cease to believe in good versus evil and then find the God within. And that's one solution to ignore, to ignore the existence of evil. Now, there's another way, and it's been employed by not only Christians, but Jewish people and Islamic people. And it's the belief that God is indeed all good and all powerful and that Unfortunately, evil does exist. Now, when we look at this term evil, let's stop and think about it just for a moment. We're not just talking about evil in what bad people do or what bad people are. It's very interesting that after 9-11, uh, 2001, the word evil entered back into our national vocabulary. Prior to that, apparently we hadn't been touched enough, or at least we hadn't felt we'd been touched enough by moral uh, evil to, to, to use that word. But the word evil is used uh, about the 9-11 attacks. And so the idea of evil isn't just people doing immoral things. But in a greater sense, the, the problem of evil existing is that it affects people. I'm not talking about that which is done in a private place where no one's watching and apparently nobody knows. Yeah, that's evil. But who's hurt by it, some would say. Well, the evil is greater than that. Eventually, even those private evils affect other people. Relationships become stunted and atrophied because of the things we do in private. We need to be careful. 
God's always watching. Uh, we need to live in a manner that shows that we know that we have a God who looks deep within us. He wants us to be, have integrity and purity at all times. But the problem of evil is that the effects of evil are so hateful and so wrong and so disturbing, so distressful. Things like disease and disaster and devastation and dismay that comes from bad things happening. And of course, death. You look at all those D words and you could probably add some more to it. That's the problem of evil existing. If they didn't have these effects, we wouldn't be so concerned about it. Well, Christians, Jews, and Islamic people have uh, found that one answer to the problem of evil existing and still believing that God is all good and God is all powerful comes because of the necessity of what they call free will. I don't use that term very much because I don't think our wills are technically free. We can't do any possible thing. We're influenced by... Uh, forces and, uh, and formative factors that we're not even aware of. So I don't think we're technically free, but we certainly have significant choice, don't we? Our choices matter. They make a difference. And we can misuse those choices. Now, if we're incapable of making a choice other than the one that provides the optimum outcome, in a sense, we would be limited and almost we'd be determined by the outcome and not be able to choose anything else. So we're allowed that, re that, uh, that strange freedom to make choices, and some of them can have very bad influences. Seems like it's a necessary condition for humans uh, of having this power of choice that they can choose other than the best thing. Now, what about the evil and the bad effects that, come from, that don't come from choices? such as natural disasters that happen that no human really chose. And we can always say as Christians, well, yes, but because of the fall, uh, the whole creation is uh, subjected to futility. And that's true. But when it comes to answering the person touched by a, an earthquake or hurricane or volcano or tsunami, those natural disasters, how do you answer that? And one answer is that these things happen to perfect us. This is called the veil of soul-making defense. The first part was the free will defense. I have to be honest, as you look at these answers that are given by um, uh, the, 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 the free will defense and the veil of soul-making defense, they're not totally satisfactory, are they? I mean, wouldn't a little small problem be enough to uh, get my attention? But as we recognize this and we think about it, you're willing to put up with a lot of bad things happening to you to keep on sinning. They didn't stop you before. People say, well, why does God have to give a person a disease? Could he just give them a toothache? You know, you could live as an absolute billionaire and all you had to do was endure a, tooth, a toothache every day. Do whatever you wanted to with that money with no restraints. I think you might find a way to put up with the toothache. Well, then let's just amp that up a little bit. It's amazing what people will go through in order to keep on sinning. So it seems to me that part of the problem of evil is that we feel that the effects are out of our control. We don't like that. That's just not right. And so we protest when bad things happen. And the person of anger reaches a looks up to the heaven and shakes his fist. Why, God? Just got done watching a movie and didn't realize how it was going to end. Had Liam Neeson in it, called The Gray. What a dismal ending. How e redemptive the ending could have been if the writer and the director and the producer and the actor would have agreed we should not leave people with the attitude that there's no inherent meaning behind all these things. But they did, and the movie became something of, 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 an, of a saddening thing for me to have watched. You see, this problem of evil enters deep down into our hearts, and Augustine also was a Christian philosopher who was affected by this. Uh, before he became a Christian, he actually had adopted a, uh, the Manichaeanism, but after he became a Christian, in his book, Confessions, he looks at some of the problems that happen. 
First of all, there's the idea that all God's creations are good. And that's a good, it's not a problem, that's a good thing. All God's creations are good. A good God, how can he create anything but good? So then how do evil situations, evil choices, where do they come from? Well, he said, some goods were higher than other goods. And angels and humans have the ability to choose. And in that order, they misused the ability. First of all, the angel that Satan used to be misused his ability and was, and he fell. Then Adam and Eve misused their ability. Basically, they looked at the fruit and said, oh, it looks like it's going to taste good and, and uh, it's sure pretty and uh, it's going to make me wise. Fitting right in with what John said in 1 John 2, 16, all that is of the, of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, not of the Father, but of the world. Well, they went for that. Now, it's not wrong to want to be wise. It's not wrong to have, want something tasty in your mouth. It's not wrong to admire the beauty of something. But there was a greater good that they did, decided to not pay attention to. And that was that there was just this one thing that God said, stay away from. They should have trusted him. They didn't. And they misused their ability to choose. They chose a lower good instead of a higher good. And as a result, evil enters into the experience of the human race. Now, some more about evil. What Augustine taught is that evil's existence is not independent. He didn't say it didn't exist, but he did teach that evil doesn't have a life of its own in the way that good is this beautiful attribute of God. That evil instead is a privation of good. It's, it's the way that darkness is related to light. You don't turn on the dark when you turn off the light. You just absent the room of light. Have you ever been in a cave that's totally without light? We went down to the Oregon caves, southern Oregon, and said, cover up your watches. If they have any reflective material, turn off your anything that has light. And then they turned their lights off, and boy, it was totally dark. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Well, they didn't turn on the dark, though. They just turned off the lights. In the sense that evil is simply the, the privation of good. In a situation that good should exist, it's somehow locked away or denied or turned away from. One way I just talk about repentance to people is that as you turn from the light, the darkness becomes stronger. And as you walk away from the light, the shadow becomes longer, doesn't it? Now, you're not walking into the dark. You're walking away from the light. And by virtue of that, things become darker. It may be that evil can be better understood in this way, Augustine said. He also taught that evil was to good as death is to life. The interesting thing about this is that um, 30 seconds after a person's body dies, it doesn't change physically. 30 seconds before they died, it's no different physically than it is 30 seconds after they die, with the exception that they cease to function as a living unit, as a living entity. Death doesn't approach them, although it does talk in a sense about death having an effect that is, uh, is awesome and uh, saddening, but life exits. And that condition of life being gone is what we call death. And so evil could be seen then not as some looming black uh, primitive and um, independent force, but instead evil is seen as that which occurs when good is taken out. Evil parasitizes the good. It lives off of the good, so to speak. It would not be there if it wasn't for the host that is good. And the parasite's existence is never of a higher order than its host's existence. Augustine also taught that evil's existence is not necessary. And here we find ourselves being influenced by modern science fiction and, and, and other literature and some of the, the, uh, the shows that talk about, uh, you know, you got to have evil in, in order to appreciate good. Oh, do you? Will there be evil in heaven? Of course, the answer is no. Will you appreciate the good in heaven? And of course, the answer is yes. You see, evil is not necessary to exist. God existed first, and God is good. The evil entered creation when uh, the human will, a good faculty, was misused. 
So Augustine concluded, in contradiction of the Greek thought that had influenced the Roman Empire, that humanity's main problem is not education, it's not lack of access to knowledge of the virtues, it's not lack of good habits. Humanity's main problem is that will. Two wills can exist in one person. You don't have that with anything else. The faculty of will being perverted, twisted, turned. Isn't this what Romans chapter 7 speaks of, the last part? Thank God we don't have to live in that, though. Romans chapter 8 says, There's therefore now no condemnation to all who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of sin and death has been put aside. And the law of life comes because we're forgiven and the Holy Spirit brings this power into our lives. You don't have to live as a Romans 7 person. Paul was writing about his existence prior to coming to Christ and the existence of the miserable person who has become a Christian and wants to go back and live under the law. Good can be appreciated without there being evil. The city of God is inhabited by humans with converted wills, Augustine wrote. And he writes this book to help answer the question as to why did Rome fall? It was traumatic to the hearers of that day, and they were actually wondering whether the Christians were to blame for it because they weren't, um, they, they, they taught about turning the other cheek and so forth. But Augustine said, no, the Christians are part of the city of God that will continue all the way through history. And the, what fell was not the eternal city, but what fell was the city of man. And it's destined to fall and be reconstructed and fall and be reconstructed and the city of God will continue all the way through until the end when the city of man is no more. And for a thousand years, the people of the West were encouraged by the writings of Augustine, the city of God. Now let's look at suffering a little bit more closely. If we're all concerned about evil and its primary problem of suffering and pain, we have a question to ask. Does the presence of suffering indicate the absence of God? Now this is one of the key questions of the book of Job. Because a person is suffering, does that mean God's not there? And if so, then would it mean that when suffering is absent, that God is there? Well, then what do you say to the person who lived 90 years and had great benefits and riches and wealth and lived like a scoundrel and died in his sleep without any pain? He automatically is in God's presence because he had no suffering. Well, it doesn't make sense, does it? So we recognize we have to try to uncouple this aspect of suffering and the presence of God. If it's not true that the presence of suffering indicates the absence of God, and if it's not true that the absence of suffering indicates the presence of God, both statements that we probably want to agree they're not true, if that's, if that's the case, that we say they're not true, then suffering and God being here or not here are not necessarily related causally. Now next, should all who die painfully go to heaven? I don't think so. How'd they live during their lives is the important question. How about all who die painlessly? Should, should they go to hell? Not necessarily. Perhaps they lived in a way that honored God all the way through. You see, the manner of a person's passing, that evil that we talk about with destructive and, and uh, disastrous death, the manner of their passing is not determinative of their eternal destiny. And when we recognize that, the problem of evil tends to look a little bit differently, doesn't it? Paul Brand wrote a book called Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants. He was a leprosy doctor. He talked about children who were born without any pain receptors at all and how they destroyed their bodies, almost used their lack of pain as a, as a, as a tool to manipulate their parents in order to get anything they wanted because their, their bodies didn't feel any pain. What a sad thing it would be to have no ability to feel pain. And the question comes up then, how much pain is too much? How much pain is enough? 
And uh, certainly with each person, there's a slightly different pain threshold. But our question, our, our problem with pain is that, for one thing, we don't think we deserve it. And secondly, we can't control it. Would a morally fallen world without suffering be heaven or hell? What would it be like if none of your choices had any significance in terms of pain? It didn't matter what you chose to do, you would not feel any pain. Now, you'd destroy your body eventually, but you wouldn't care. That's insane, isn't it? We want to see that pain may very well be something that God gives to help us to discover the right ways to live, the right ways to move, the right ways to walk. And it's also a way that God can tell us that we are off the, off the path. C.S. Lewis said that pain is God's megaphone. I wish there were ways to learn things other than by pain, and I'm going to look for them every chance I get. We should never ask that God send pain to anybody in order to teach them something. But we do recognize, like Job did, that there were things to be learned about God. He encountered God himself, he said in Job 42, through the suffering that he experienced. The veil of soul-making defense, that is that bad things happen in a non-moral sense because God's trying to make us into better people and have virtues, is acceptable um, if you don't think that God's role should be that of a zookeeper. Because a zookeeper is supposed to make sure the animals are fed and comfortable and, you know, don't have any uh, discomfort. If that's what God's role is, then uh, the veil of soul-making defense seems kind of harsh. But if indeed you believe that God's role is not a zookeeper as much as God's role is as a parent of his creation, that he wants his creation to grow, especially humans, to grow and learn to make the kinds of decisions that will reflect his nature in them, then there needs maybe at times for them to have uh, an experience in which they find limitations. And there the veil of soul making starts to make much more sense. You wouldn't learn patience if you never had to wait. To me, the, pain, the problem of evil should really be looked at in another way. The problem of evil, evil needs to be looked at not through the suffering that humans experience because of pain and evil. But what about God? We have a God who feels pain. Does God feel pain? Well, if he doesn't, then there's an element of experience that we have that God does not have. And philosophically, that doesn't make much sense. This is absurd. Scripture teaches us otherwise as well. If he does feel pain, then his ability to feel pain is not limited like ours is. Now, this boggles my mind, and it causes me a lot of distress in my heart. If God feels pain, and sin pains God, why did he create us? The Bible says in Genesis 6 that his heart was filled with pain. The Bible says that you can grieve the spirit. The Bible says that the Son of God um, had, was acquainted with grief. That should not have been the case. Grief is a real thing that, that God experiences without measure. Nothing about God is experienced in um, a microscopic amounts. He is maximal love, maximal strength, maximal wrath and maximal pain. He can't cry himself to sleep when there's pain. He doesn't get distracted from pain. How does God put up with us? How does God allow circumstances to occur that he knows we're going to fail in and allow them anyway and feel the pain of that bad decision? The study of the character and attributes of God can be the most rewarding and enriching experience in learning that you will ever encounter. And as an apologist, as someone who wants to make a defense of the faith, you owe it to yourself to understand the attributes of God. See how they all fit together. They're all part of who God is. Actually, they're all part of who God is. They're all all of what God is. And it's an amazing thing to see this God who allows himself to be touched. Love creates the possibility of evil. A creator's options, number one, create nothing. Number two, create an amoral world in which there's no evil and no good. Number three, create robots, uh, automatons with no free choice. Number four is to create free will or 
significant choice I like to use, to choose right or wrong, to love or not to love. Love must not be coerced to be true love. It's got to be free, doesn't it? So there's no love possible in the options one through three, creating nothing, creating an amoral world, or creating only automatons. It's only possible in the fourth option, God creating a world in which will is free to be used. Love requires loving enough to give the freedom to reject the love. Love without pain is superficial love. Evil is man's choice, not God's. We must take responsibility for our own actions. Don't blame God for man's evil. Philosophical doom. How do we know which creation option is the best? Well, it requires ultimate knowledge about ourselves. Knowledge that only can be given to us because we purposely deceive ourselves. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can know it? We're, that's what we do best is deceive ourselves about ourselves. So it requires ultimate knowledge to know which creation option is best. But any choice but number four would end up annihilating ourselves as we currently are. So let's assume that we exist. If God creates nothing, poof, we're gone. If God creates only an amoral universe, poof, we're gone. If God creates automatons or robots, poof, we're gone. Self-annihilation in order to limit pain is the only logical recourse unless you're willing to accept a creation in which evil can be chosen. Atheists may not be willing to pursue the logic, but it's true. Religious evils nullify religion. Well, people point to the religions of the world and say, oh, look at all the awful things, especially you Christians, by the way. Copernicus was so afraid to publish from the church that he didn't even publish until they published his stuff after he died and Galileo was forced to recant by an evil uh, religious authorities and the Crusades were this terrible effort of people in the West to come over and, and, and try to you know, fight off the infidels in, um, in the Holy Land. By the way, the Crusades were a response to the Islamic people uh, attacking um, um, uh, Constantinople hundreds of years prior to that, but we usually forget that part. The Inquisition in which people were uh, forced to uh, convert in Spain and Italy and so forth. Slavery and awful evil perpetrated by some religious people or people who claim to be religious. By the way, you know, the guy who wrote Amazing Grace was uh, a captain of a slave ship, John Newton. Eventually he came to Christ, abandoned his ideas of slavery and, and wrote Amazing Grace. How about the terrible crimes in Bosnia and um, Serbia and so forth and Kosovo and R Rwanda and religious wars in Ireland and elsewhere. These are all awful things. There, there cannot be a God. Your religion is worthless because of bad things happening. Well, what we recognize as we look closely at these is none of these injustices supported are supported by Christ's teachings. He never told people to live that way. And Christ's teachings clearly stand out against such kinds of uh, things. But the point is, the critics are upset because moral goodness has been violated. But what's the source of it, if not a moral God that Christianity teaches? Isn't that being hypocritical? To be upset because the source of that which is uh, to be good um, allows for bad choices to be made? What about the greater injustices of atheism? Hitler wasn't acting for God. Stalin was the leader of a great nation whose goal was the planned materialistic atheism. How about Mao and Paul, Pol Pot in, in um, Cambodia or Idi Amin? These were not religious people. Look at the terrible injustices they perpetrated as a result of their non-God worldviews. And all their actions were consistent with the kinds of things that atheists talk about, self-determination, with much suffering, those who got in their way. See, you see, self-destruction is not hypocritical to an atheist for some strange reason. It ought to be, though. Where is God when it hurts? Atheism has no moral basis to even ask this question. Hurting is, for them, merely physics and chemistry. Certainly not an evil that must be compelled to fix. To fix. God does, 
address hurting and evil in his way, in his time, and effectively. So where is atheism when it hurts? Might be a good question to ask. Those who say, where is God when it hurts? Oh, they have to say, the pain's really bad. Not bad, because it's just a moral chemistry and physics. Tell that to the grieving mother. Well, the injustice is okay because there really is no injustice. Solution to the problem of pain and evil is Jesus Christ. He exposed himself to pain. It takes God's love for man all the way to the cross. It requires a self-sacrifice to earn the ability to be trusted. Love and justice were married through mercy and grace. And a world without love is no world we want to have. A world without justice against evil is likewise intolerable. Jesus Christ demonstrates his power over evil through the resurrection. It requires the ability to create life from death. And he demonstrated it. The cross shows man's inhumanity to be evil. The cross shows God's humanity to be good. Without Jesus Christ, nothing makes sense and requires a great deal of trust on our part as well as God. Show me an atheistic Joan of Arc, an atheistic Florence Nightingale or Mother Teresa, an atheistic Martin Luther King Jr., or an atheistic Jesus of Nazareth. Why were they what they were? They knew the truth of God's reality. Romans teaches that we see in, uh, what we see elsewhere in Scripture. We have no right to complain against God. And when we do, we expose ourselves as disobedient. God's under no obligation to give us an intellectually satisfying answer to the problem of evil.